we need all the okay. help we can get. Well, wait, we're trying to help move the technology forward. Some things we don't understand very well. You know that. This is where we are. We're working on... One of the ways Haywood is improving engines is by reducing friction. Almost half the energy in the combustion chamber is lost to friction as pistons rub against the walls of the cylinder. Using a laser to observe the process, Haywood tests different lubricants and piston geometries to find small ways to save energy. Anywhere you see white, it's like oil. here, is oil. And what we want is where, where the rings are, it's dark, you want a little oil to lubricate the rings. Just to keep enough. friction low, but just enough. If there's too much, it'll go into the cylinder and we'll lose some oil. Right. So that's what we're learning about, and it really feeds back into designing all of this better and improving fuel consumption. Over several decades, automotive engineers at Sloan and other labs around the world have increased engine efficiency by 30%. Engines and transmissions uh, have got steadily more efficient year by year by year by year by year. So it's better technology. Then the question is, what do we do with these more powerful and more efficient engines? <laughs> put them into increasing vehicle performance so our vehicles accelerate faster, more aggressively, and we put them into larger vehicles, heavier vehicles. And we're better off because these vehicles are more efficient. Had they not been more efficient, we'd be even worse off. But we haven't gained. We've sort of stood still. Technology by itself does not increase fuel economy. The role of technology is to enable smart regulations, is to enable reductions in oil consumption and greenhouse gases through uh, federal action, not in place of federal action. History shows regulation does increase fuel economy. After the 1973 oil shortage, Congress created mileage standards forcing automakers to build more efficient vehicles. By 1987, average mileage had increased dramatically. But that caused oil prices to fall, which in turn led to public indifference. In the 1970s, it's the early 1980s, we doubled the fuel economy of cars. And then, starting in the mid-80s, we stopped. Mileage standards remained unchanged from 1985 to 2007, and truck and SUV sales almost doubled. Because these vehicles have lower standards than cars, average fuel economy today is actually a bit less than it was 20 years ago, despite hard-won gains in engine efficiency. Many people buy heavy, inefficient vehicles because they feel safer. Amory Lovins is a champion of a revolutionary approach to making cars that are efficient and safe. I'm a recovering experimental physicist, and I'd been thinking about the physics of cars and why are they so inefficient that, you know, your car is using a hundred times its weight in ancient plants every day and yet only 0.3% of that energy ends up moving the driver. This didn't seem very good. In 1982, Lovins founded the Rocky Mountain Institute, a Colorado think tank. But, uh, Among the 50 full-time staff are a handful of automotive engineers who have helped Lovins rethink the physics of the car. Yep. <laughs> One would argue if you had half the car, you would need half the battery and half the motor to push it around. And half and the money to pay for the car. And half the money to pay for it, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Lovins realized that cars could be more efficient and if he could find ways to make the engine move less weight. We started digging into how to make the car lighter with better aerodynamics, with lower rolling resistance. We ended up concluding it was quite straightforward to triple the efficiency of a car at roughly the same cost. Lovin's group replaced the conventional auto body with 14 lightweight components that lock together to form a reinforced shell with half the weight of steel. 
the tapered roof line to the smooth underbody, every surface is streamlined to reduce drag. If you directly save a pound in a car, you actually save more like a pound and a half from needing less engine to accelerate it, less brakes to stop it, less suspension to hold it up, and so on. The hyper car reduces weight without reducing size by making parts with tiny carbon fibers that are heated with nylon to form a composite stronger than steel. The wings and much of the fuselage of Boeing's new 787 Dreamliner are made with carbon composites, which will save 20% in fuel. Race cars are also made with carbon composites. After hitting a wall at 160 miles an hour, the driver in this car walked away. How are you feeling? Uh, a bit shaken, but I'm okay, as you can see. Oh, sorry. All my bits are intact, so it's good. It goes to show how strong the cars are. With such light but strong materials, you can make cars that are big, which is protective and comfortable, without also making them heavy, which is hostile and inefficient. Therefore, you can save oil and lives and indeed money all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Today, the hypercar is still just an idea, embodied by this one-of-a-kind prototype sitting in the corner of Lovin's shop. Car makers have spent a hundred years perfecting ways to mass-produce cars from steel, and Lovin's has failed to convince them to make a radical change in materials. Carbon fiber is expensive, and molding it into parts is labor-intensive. We'll Undaunted, Lovins is now developing machinery that can mass-produce parts at an affordable price. Drawn by curiosity and skepticism, Ray has come to the Rockies, leaving Tom in bed with a cold. Yeah, my brother didn't want to come out here. I, I, I knew it. Too cold, he saw the weather forecast. Figured he'd call in sick. He had that phony little sniffle. Nah. Hey, Amory. Ray. <laughs> hey, welcome. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> oh, pleasure. We got such cool stuff to show you. Well, geez, I'm really impressed because I thought this was going to be something like a carnival car, you know, some little tiny little thing that you oh, have to no. get shoehorned into. This is a, a real car. This will carry five modern size adults in comfort. <laughs> Super sized adults. <laughs> up, up to 69 cubic feet of cargo. In fact, we figure this could cruise on the highway at 55 miles an hour on the same power to the wheels that today's SUVs use on a hot day to run the air conditioner. Really? <laughs> oh, that's pretty neat. This is the most complex and heavily loaded uh, part of this car. It's the whole side assembly. Oh, it's where the doors would go. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Oh, sure. Yeah, and I'll bet you can lift that with one hand. You think? Yeah. I don't know about weekly. Oh, it's pretty light. Yeah. It's, it's a few pounds. It's, uh... It, isn't that amazing? Yeah, it which, is amazing. Which means any part, any of the 14 body parts, can be lifted by one worker with no hoist. So you don't need jigs and robots and welders. It just snaps together and you glue it. Then it's stronger than the original material. So you just got rid of the body shop. That's why this is so revolutionary for manufacturing. Well, I did bring a piece of test equipment from my lab. Can, I, can I use it? Yeah. You wicked fellow. <laughs> Stand back. Uncle. That's strong. That's <laughs> strong. Jeez, and you know, there were a couple of tiny little scuffs. And then, nothing got telegraphed to the back. The back is completely unscathed. The case for carbon fiber is very strong, but in 